To help set the scene for the year's activities, we now visit the workshops at the end of the display year and learn just how a season of display flying can take a toll out of these important aircraft. Come out. Fantastic. This is the, uh, the, there you are. the toughest Look one of them I Well, uh, I'll never doubt you again. <laughs> <laughs> That's come out of Look at that. Yes, at the end of this season, we uh, finished up with quite a bit of work. Uh, unusual, because at the end of any season, we only have one or two aircraft to uh, work on over the winter months. But this year, it seems to be in about seven aircraft, with the Spitfire probably uh, the most tricky to try and sort out with a lubrication problem. The uh, Hurricane over at Duxford has got a supercharger problem. The Hawker Hind was showing some bearing material in the filters towards the end of the flying season and we took that out of the air as a precautionary measure. Likewise, the SE5A, the uh, bearings on that, the, the plain white metal bearings in the engine for that, were showing a bit of metal in the filter. The other aircraft that we're working on is the Avro Tutor. The engine is making a lot of rattling noises uh, at the end of the season. Uh, the new acquisition that we didn't have uh, at the end of the season, but we're working on now to be flying again, uh, flying for us next year, is the little Compass Swift. And uh, on the face of it, there wasn't much that needed doing to it, but uh, we, we've given it a very thorough inspection found several things that we've improved and uh, done our way and uh, just given it a fresh coat of paint, smartened it up and uh, replaced this and that because it's going to stay with the collection now for, well, for eternity hopefully, forever. The Gladiator was the only serviceable one out of the big four and that was the one that we took out of the air and made unserviceable. But the fabric on that, the Irish linen on the Gladiator had been on for 24, 25 years and that's about the life of both the Irish linen and the structure underneath. Although it is a fully metal, metalised structure, aluminium and steel, it did need a thorough inspection. One of the aircraft that will be new to us here at the collection next year will be the Dezuta, the Dezuta monoplane. The engine runs for that will be sometime in 1997, not quite sure when. It's not just our own aircraft that we've been working on uh, during the winter, although we're busy enough on those, but we've been working on Stephen Gray's Rolls-Royce Falcon 3 engine from his Bristol fighter for the last two years. We haven't had much to do with the airframe at all, uh, just a bit of systems work, but most of it's been done by uh, Sky Sport Engineering a mile and a half from here. And then we'll be uh, assembling the aircraft and certifying the, the whole aircraft, hopefully to keep the, or have the aircraft flying here in formation with our own Bristol fighter to make rather a, a unique sight. We start then with the collection's Bristol F2B fighter at the Air Spectacular in May. It was an appropriate event to cover the World War I exhibits because they all flew at the show. The SE-5A was a very powerful fighter for its time and equipped 16 RAF squadrons at the end of the war. Today's display was curtailed by engine trouble. The Shuttleworth family firm built 50 Sopwith triplanes like this in World War I. This is a replica, built by the Northern Aeroplane Workshops, but faithful even down to the Clergé engine. The Pop was another successful Sopwith design and served with distinction as a fighter on the Western Front. This aircraft was built in 1918 as a two-seater for civilian use. The LVG C6 was used extensively by the Imperial German Air Force for observation and light bombing.
The Avro 504 first flew in 1913 and had an unusually long and successful career. This particular Bristol fighter was built in 1918 and didn't see war service. It was restored by the Bristol Aeroplane Company in 1952 and has been in the collection ever since, undergoing extensive refurbishment in the early 1980s. The Sopwith triplane's operational life was short. It was replaced by the Camel. But in the hands of the Royal Naval Air Service, it played a leading part in winning command of the air. Three captured airframes were cannibalized to build this LVG and it was tested by the RAF at the end of the war. In recent times it was rebuilt at Old Warden. It has a tendency to overheat and it's not a favorite with the pilots, but as a development of the aircraft which made the first bombing raid on London, it is of great historical importance. Like the Sopwith triplane, the pup was also quickly replaced by the camel. It was the pup which pioneered deck landing and so led to the development of the aircraft carrier. The troops today are members of the Norfolk Gun Club and the pyrotechnics are provided by John Lowe. Four 504s made the first pre-planned bombing raid in history, but it was in the training role that it made its mark. This is one of a handful pressed into military service in World War II. We conclude with the only aircraft that flew at every Shuttleworth show in 1996, the Gloucester Gladiator. It sits nicely in the collection as the last of the old and the first of the new. As a biplane with a fixed undercarriage, it was destined for early obsolescence. But the enclosed cockpit, flaps and four 303 Browning machine guns gave it a logical place in the move towards the monoplane. As we complete the editing of this programme, the Gladiator is undergoing a necessary rebuild and despite the heavier than usual winter workload, should fly in a new livery in 1997.
The pilots are always asking us to show more landings, so we'll finish with one. They might not thank us though, so we won't name the pilot, but then this video has been for the engineers. <laughs>